Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be doing another video essay in which I will be holding the microphone like, and I quote, a donut. If you're new here, I'm Carla. I post video essays like this one, as well as crochet content and content about living abroad. So if you're interested in any of that, please do subscribe. We recently hit 1K and I'm very proud of the little community that we're growing. So if you want some wholesome, inquisitive vibes, come join us. And as always, if you have any questions about any of those topics or this topic that we're talking about today, then leave a comment down below. And without further ado, let's get started. So this video essay's topic is overconsumption. And as a fun question, whether or not your Stanley Cup is worse than Taylor Swift's private jet. Spoiler alert, it's not. But that doesn't mean that overconsumption isn't an issue, so I want to touch on this topic of individual choice when it comes to climate change and trying to make a difference. But I think it's best if we start off with this. What is overconsumption? Quite simply, it's defined as the action or fact of consuming something to excess. But when we talk about overconsumption in a climate context, it typically refers to the overconsumption of fossil fuels and not necessarily overconsumption of goods that we can buy at Target, for example. However, the craze that we've seen surrounding the Stanley Cup is a prime example of overconsumption on an individual level. So to give a bit of background, if you even need any, Stanley is actually a brand that really does represent the working class and athletes of the US, or at least it used to. Anyone from construction workers to super avid or pro hikers could be seen with a Stanley branded water bottle or cup. But now it's become a symbol of the many wellness trends from the clean girl aesthetic to hot girl walks. If you're someone like me, the Stanley Cup came out of nowhere, but the way it became such a big social media trend was actually completely planned. So in 2020, the then new president of Stanley noticed that the Stanley Cup, the quencher, was really popular with the Utah-based blog called The Buy Guide. So he tapped their influence and started using tactics like affiliate marketing to turn the cup itself into a massive trend. And that was really, really smart. He took something that organically became popular among a certain group of women asked them to start promoting it on their social media, gave them affiliate links. Then you can imagine it starts to spread to other blogs or to people's personal social media, and then eventually to TikTok. We've seen people buy these Stanley Cups in mass, which is ironic because it's the type of product that you should really only have to buy once in your life. But the fact that people aren't buying Stanley Cups once is what's really setting it apart from other big water bottles that blew up in the past like Visco Girl Hydro Flasks or Chili's bottles or Yeti bottles. Sure, maybe people bought more than one if they lost their Hydro Flask or if they really, really wanted a new color, but the Hydro Flask and those other bottles I mentioned that did become big social media trends didn't have the same collectability factor. Whereas the Stanley Cup, whether it was through marketing or organic social media trends, became or has become a collectible for many people. We've all seen the videos of people showing their massive Stanley Cup collections or of them running to Target to get an exclusive release. And this collectability of the product is shown by a huge jump in profits. So the company's revenue jumped from 74 million in 2019 to 750 million in 2023. And as CNBC reported, that was largely thanks to the quencher line. Also, I can't say quencher with, with a straight face. It's really difficult. And yes, there's some irony in the fact that this is a reusable cup that people are buying and over consuming in a way that we've kind of never seen before for this sort of product. And while I'm not really sure I agree with this, some people do argue that this sort of overconsumption, overconsumption of eco or sustainable or reusable goods, is better than other types of overconsumption. So in Wired, the CEO of iFixit, which sells repair kits and guides, Kyle Weens, said, I dislike overconsumption, but if you're going to overconsume, this feels pretty good. He went on to say that plastic bottles are the catastrophically bad thing, so if this is replacing that in any way, then 
it's good. But to be fair, he does take into consideration this sort of collectability aspect of the Stanley Cup, saying that now that it's become a fashion trend or a status symbol, it's quote, in a different world, which is really, really true. And the reason why this becoming a fashion trend really changes things is because it gives way for the cup to no longer be timeless. Although with a 40 ounce gigantic cup, I don't know if it ever would have been timeless, even if it didn't become such a trend, but at least it would have just been a big cup. But now if you have a Stanley, it's just, it's a symbol of something more. Whereas you could have a bottle that looks a lot like a hydro flask and it's not necessarily going to look dated. It's just going to look like a reusable water bottle, like we all have. And for me, the overconsumption issue comes down to this. Are the consumers of the Stanley Cup wealthy? Could they find better alternatives? Do they already have reusable cups or water bottles? And perhaps more importantly, are they posting the cup on social media and encouraging people to buy, 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 instead of maybe just buying one if you don't already have a reusable bottle? And of course, these viral videos of people showing their Stanley Cup collections don't represent the majority of consumers. There aren't any exact figures at the moment, but I would predict that a lot of people have one Stanley Cup. I mean, they're expensive. And Weens did touch on this saying, if what it takes is to have a mass movement around this and the side effect is that you get some crazy people that have 40 of them, I guess I would say I'm okay with it because we are mainstreaming the right behavior. I don't completely agree with this because when I've seen people promote their Stanley Cup, it's because it's a trend. It's because it matches their outfit or their nails, et cetera, et cetera. It's not because it's reusable. Reusable water bottles have been around and popular and trendy, at least in the US, for a really long time. But I do agree with the sentiment that this isn't the worst thing because there are many other big polluters. So how does something like the Stanley Cup trend compare to these massive polluters like big shot celebrities and large corporations? Well, it doesn't. Let's start with this fact. America's richest 10% are responsible for 40% of its planet heating pollution. And the income of the top 1% alone, households making more than $550,000 per year, was linked to 15% to 17% of this pollution. And this fact that the powerful and wealthy are the ones harming the planet the most isn't new. From 1990 to 2015, the carbon emissions of the super rich globally were more than double the emissions of the poorest half of humanity. Over that same time, the poorest 50%, around 3.1 billion people, were responsible for just 7% of emissions. That's from Oxfam. And while there are things like carbon taxes to keep these big polluters in check, it doesn't really seem to be targeting the right people. Jared Starr, a sustainability scientist at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and one of the authors of the report I cited earlier, said that carbon taxes disproportionately punish the poor while having little impact on the extremely wealthy. And don't hate me for this, but who is an extremely wealthy individual who is 10 times more popular on social media than the Stanley Cup. Miss Taylor Swift. And this video is not an attack on Swifties. I like a good Taylor Swift tune now and then. And I've seen plenty of Swifties criticize Taylor Swift for her polluting actions. So this isn't a hater video, but we're going to use her and her climate footprint as an example. So I'm sure many of us saw this headline over the holidays. Taylor Swift produces 138 tons of CO2 emissions in three months to see soulmate Travis Kelsey. And perhaps you and I as pop culture enthusiasts, so to speak, are fine with this because as Unilad put it, most of us would do anything for love and Tay-Tay is clearly no exception. You know, Taylor Swift is living a fantasy romance for everyone and people are eating it up. Of course she has to fly to see her soulmate. She can't get on a commercial plane. And to put things into perspective, because 138 tons of CO2 emissions sounds like a lot, but what does that actually mean? Well, according to the Greenhouse Gas Equivalencies Calculator, this is the equivalent of energy used by 17 houses in one year, or the electricity use of 26.9 homes for a year. And it's not just Miss, Miss Swift, okay? According to The Guardian, private jets belonging to 200 celebrities, CEOs, oligarchs, and billionaires have spent a combined total of 11 years in the air 
since the start of 2022. And the carbon footprint of those flights would be equivalent to the total emissions of almost 40,000 Britons. I know buying 40 Stanley Cups isn't good, but it's definitely not equal to that. And I'd like to note that when it comes to Taylor Swift, I've seen plenty of Swifties criticize her actions. I've seen some Swifties online make videos where they seem genuinely disappointed in someone that they idolize and, you know, kind of seeing the illusion of her celebrity crumble before them. And there was this article in Forbes, which was heavily criticizing Swifties for overconsumption during the Eras tour for doing things like making bracelets out of plastic beads and staying at hotels and eating at restaurants. And I think when we criticize individuals and especially, you know, teenage girls for these individual decisions, we're not encouraging more sustainable behavior on an individual level, which we can do and is important, but rather I think we're detracting from the real issue at hand, which would be holding big polluters like Taylor Swift or, you know, Shell and BP to account. However, I do respect this one question from the article. We need to reflect whether current carbon intensive lifestyles are sustainable and whether the younger generation should create icons of individuals with egregious climate records. I think a lot of Taylor Swift's fans are getting older and becoming more critical and you know, becoming more open to the fact that she is just a human and she's a billionaire and that you can still enjoy someone's music or art without necessarily defending the fact that she has such a large carbon footprint when she could do something about it or at least could do more about it. However, I still think the article in Forbes was really underestimating just how outspoken Gen Z is, including Swifties. He was kind of suggesting that Gen Z is no different to boomers in their attitudes towards climate change and who they idolize in pop culture, but I just don't think that's true. I don't think we would have been having as big of a cultural conversation around Michael Jackson or Madonna's carbon emissions back in the 80s, but that's just my opinion. And yes, I know that just because a celebrity celebrity's private jet is flying doesn't mean that the celebrity is actually in that plane, but does that really make a difference? You can let me know. If it makes a difference to you, then I'm curious as to why. And going back to that viral article from Unilad, a spokesperson for Taylor Swift actually responded to Unilad in a statement. It said, before the tour kicked off in March of 2023, Taylor purchased more than double the carbon credits needed to offset all tour travel. The excess credits means Taylor could have accounted for more than enough to cover her latest romance springing up in the middle of her Stella tour, with her trips to support Kelsey upping her carbon emissions alongside her planned tour travels. I mean, carbon credits, if you want to look into them, don't really mean anything, but there's some sort of accountability there. Kind of. And when it comes not to big individuals like Taylor Swift, but rather to big companies, approximately 71% of carbon emissions can be traced back to just 100 fossil fuel producers since 1988. Which brings us to another question. Do individual choices matter? Because it's starting to feel like they don't. And first, I'll say yes. Richard Heed, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Climate Accountability Institute, said to Vox, it's the consumers that actually burn and demand the fossil fuels that these companies provide. So what does that mean? It means that if we reduce our demand for certain products, the market will have to adjust, at least in theory. But to counter that and to modify my answer to the question, do individual choices matter? I'll read you another quote from Richard Heed. It's going to take corporations, corporate leaders, local politicians who might grapple with how to reduce community-wide emissions in their cities and towns. Every part of society has to participate. I know that not every part of society will participate. So policies are needed to help. He goes on to explain that demand and options need to change. And in our capitalist society, you know, consumers can change their demand, but the options and, you know, the affordable options have to be there. And this comes about from, you know, taxing carbon and maybe subsidizing greener forms of energy, for example. But that's really a decision that only the big guys can make, not you and me, except from collective action, voting, organizing, etc. But not necessarily from refusing to buy a Stanley Cup. However, I'd argue that big change, you know, it does have to start small. People have to care. So signaling to your friends, to people online, to people around you that, you know, 
buying 40 Stanley Cups is freaking stupid is, is a good thing. I'm not saying you should buy 40 Stanley Cups. Definitely not. I'm just saying that our energies should be focused elsewhere if we want to make real change. I guess a simpler way to put it is that if we want change on a large scale, people have to actually want it, and that does start to some extent on the individual level. That being said, why do we continue to attack each other over our individual choices and not these big polluters like celebrities, fossil fuel giants, etc. And one reason I can give you for this is because that's what they want you to do. If you've ever taken, you know, an advertising course or you're just interested in pop culture, maybe you remember the crying Indian ad. This was a 1970s ad from the ad council that featured an actor dressed as a stereotypical American Indian crying at the pollution before him on his land. I mean, there are so many things wrong with this ad, but it did have a big impact, so it kind of worked, at least to the end that they wanted it to work. But again, it's just another example of not getting to the real issue. Another example of how they want you to think that you are the problem, BP's ingenious carbon footprint calculator. I do feel like it crossed my mind that an energy company is helping you figure out your carbon footprint. That's strange, but also that's amazing. And that's what they want you to think. But again, this just distracts you from the fact that these big companies like BP itself can make the most change, can reduce their carbon emissions drastically, and that it's not you taking two minutes longer in the shower than you should. Also, if you got this far into the video, comment, comment the emoji with the glasses, because I want to know if when you were in school, you also had to like fill out the BP carbon footprint calculator and figure out your carbon footprint. I'm really curious because I remember doing that and I'm sure it was really popular in the 2000s. So these tactics like the crying Indian advert and the carbon footprint calculator are what researchers at San Diego State University and Southwestern University call capitalistic agency. By endorsing the environmentalist image and removing themselves as the source of the problem, Oil giants limit people's ability to think about other forms of environmental action beyond consumption. They don't want you to organize. They don't want you to protest. They don't want you to consider voting for a greener candidate. They want you to, you know, stop littering and take a shorter shower. They don't want you to force the government to force them to make any significant changes because that's not good for business. That quote I read about capitalistic agency and her definition of it was from Sarah Munoz, who is a doctoral student in political science who specializes in climate change adaptation. And she gives another really good example of how big oil ingrains itself into our popular culture or our individual communities. And she gives the case of Louisiana and Shell as an example. Referring to the ecological activities of oil companies in Louisiana as a true Cajun environmental movement, Lobbyists solicit local identities and citizen support in an effort to preserve their operating activities. This other form of individualization targets climate policies as a direct attack on the interests and well-being of local populations. A veritable oil culture has thus emerged through community investment. For example, Shell's long-standing funding of the Jazz and Heritage Festival in New Orleans, or of local hurricane recovery operations. I mean, that's, that's something else, you know? A company like Shell involving itself so much in specific vulnerable communities in Louisiana, as well as in the arts, to get people on their side, you know? Why would we lobby against a company like Shell? If they're funding our jazz festival, which is a rich part of that state's culture, that community's culture, and if they're helping with hurricane relief efforts. And she calls this an entanglement of Cajun identities with the historical development of the local oil industry. So if big oil, fossil fuel giants, whatever you want to call them, insert themselves into our lives and our communities and our psychologies and into pop culture, etc., etc., what can we do? Well, it's good to address the fact that yes, overconsumption is an issue. I don't want any comments saying that 
I think you should buy a million Stanley Cups because I don't. And yes, it's not good to use more water, more electricity, more gas than you need. But if you care about climate activism, that can't be where your efforts stop. Because for them, that's the ideal. Because you know, fossil fuel giants, they hope that you stop there. Like I said before, they don't want you to vote, they don't want you to organize, etc. And that's exactly why organizing, protesting, collective action, voting, etc. are the best things that you can do. And one of the goals of that should be to hold billionaires and to hold large corporations accountable. Richard Heed, who I quoted a couple times before, said the same thing. We need to make the right voting choices. The household sector and personal consumption are big components globally, but it won't solve the problem to the degree that we need. We need leadership that puts a price on carbon. We need leadership that supports sane energy policies. And finally, I think we also need to have more grace with ourselves and our individual actions. Don't beat yourself up if you you know, did something that wasn't completely sustainable. We can all continue to get better in the ways that we consume and in what we promote online and in person. Okay, my SD card ran out of space, so I think that's a sign that I need to stop yapping. But to sum things up, have more grace with yourself and your individual choices. Don't attack other people unless they're doing something, you know, incredibly stupid like buying 40 Stanley Cups. Yeah, you should probably tell them something. But more importantly, look into ways that you can elicit real change. Vote for the right individuals. And yes, publicly criticize big billionaires, big celebrities, big companies that are making horrible decisions for the planet that affect the rest of us. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you got this far, why not subscribe? I would love that if you did. And let me know in the comments what other topics you want me to cover and what other sort of content you want to see from me. I'm Carlos Calling Everywhere. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye.